Good yeah. afternoon, and I want to uh, welcome uh, both our audience here at the Heart Research Institute on the Texas A&M University campus uh, and our listeners on KEDT to the fourth and final panel discussion about the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. The panel is hosted by the Heart Research Institute yeah. for Gulf of Mexico Studies and KEDT. I'm a Dr. Larry McKinney. I'm the director of HRI, and I'll be acting as your moderator. I want to thank uh, KEDT, its management and staff for broadcasting this four-week series on what's become our country's greatest uh, environmental disaster. Our goal has been to make expertise at the Heart Research Institute and at the NM Corpus Christi campus available to our community so you can better understand what you're hearing and seeing on news and other programming about the oil spill and what it means to us here in the Gulf and to our nation. This would not, uh, I just want to let it draw, this wouldn't be possible uh, but for the financial support, support of, of listeners like you all out there in the audience. I know we're in the middle of a pledge drive, you, you, you heard that, but it's really important. We, this is the only uh, radio station that can make something like this possible. They can't do it, and, and commercial free, except for this one little commercial, this will be the last one you hear uh, uh, before we get to the panel. Wouldn't be possible without your support, so you can call in now to 855-2000, 855-2000, or 1-800-333-9831, 1-800-333-9831, to help continue programming like this in our community, and I really appreciate it. Now, if you're also listening or watching us uh, out there in the audience, you too can get in on this and ask, ask questions of our expert panel today. All you have to do is, uh, is send your email question to questions, that's question with an S, questions, at kedt.org, questions at kedt.org. Just include your first name and where you are, and we'll get those questions on the air and try to get them answered by our experts. One, one more announcement to make, though, and I think this, again, is a, another uh, outcome of, of being able to work with KDT as we are. Uh, Judge Neal had listened to this program and, and asked the question, are we prepared uh, for an oil spill, spill here in New Oasis County? And he decided that we need an answer to that. So. Uh, Judge Neal has organized a, uh, a New Oasis County Oil Spill Response Summit that will be held here on the campus at the University Center in room B and C Friday, July 9th from 2.30 to 4.30. And the goal of that summit is to uh, make sure that we are prepared for any potential impacts of this existing spill or any other spill. So I think that's a, a wonderful service to the community judges putting together so we will be, be ready to, to deal with this thing. And as we all know, that preparation is really important keeping the oil out of our weapons and off our beaches is uh, that's critical. And so the better prepared we can be, uh, the better off we'll be uh, all together. So I appreciate what the judge is doing to help that, uh, help that happen. Let me introduce our panel uh, uh, very quickly. And I think we're just gonna go right into our, our panel presentations. And, and you'll, if you'll be prepared as I introduce you, after I introduce you, you can, you can start. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Jim Jabot. Uh, Dr. Jabot is a coastal, ecology, uh, coastal geologist with experience in mapping and monitoring and studying oil shorelines. During the 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill, uh, he, would, he worked very closely on these types of projects. He's also conducted oil shoreline surveys in Saudi Arabia, and he's currently updating the shoreline types in Texas for oil spill contingency planning, an important aspect of being ready for oil spills ourselves. But this time I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Jabot for some opening remarks. Thank you, Larry. Uh, my comments are based on my past experience with the Exxon Valdez spill and the uh, work that I did in the Gulf, Persian Gulf spill, uh, as well as my general knowledge of the geology and the coastal processes in the uh, affected area. Um, there's a great website that just came online called uh, geoplatform.gov, and now we can go to that website. It's an interactive map, and we can see where the shorelines that have been oiled um, are and what the distribution of the shoreline oiling is. You can also get a forecast of the near shore oil slick uh, to get an idea of where the oil may be going next. And I, I noted that forecast here, uh, the current forecast through Sunday are for winds um, out of the east. And if you can picture the uh, Mississippi Delta, most of our impact on the Mississippi Delta has been on the west uh, side of the, the main bird foot uh, delta coming out. Now with this uh, new forecast, we, we have um, the northern edge of the spill moving up into the uh, Mississippi-Alabama shoreline and then into the Chandelier Islands and, and the east side of the Mississippi Delta. And so I'm, I'm sure through uh, Sunday and through next week, we'll probably be seeing a lot more images of uh, heavy oiling along the shorelines. 
So we now have a situation where even the unprecedented attempts at dispersing the oil at sea, um, shorelines are being impacted, even with all the dispersant being applied. And we also uh, have seen all that on the news, and now you can, you can see the actual data on geoplatform.gov. Keeping oil off shorelines is the chief concern for oil spill response. Skimming, burning, and dispersing of oil with chemicals while it's still at sea has been a preferred uh, response to past spills, and now this one. It's been thought that just about anything you can do to prevent shorelines from being oiled is worth it. And this is because of the physical and toxic impacts of oil on coastal habitats, namely beaches, marshes, and flats, that are essential to the coastal and marine ecosystem. It is also important to keep oil uh, from the shorelines because of the difficulty in cleaning it up once it's there. And the preference to do anything possible to keep oil from uh, impacting the shoreline is undoubted, undoubtedly also because that's what people see and that's where they are directly affected by it when they go to the beach. Uh, the shoreline has now been mapped uh, from just, that the shoreline oil has now been mapped uh, from just east of Pensacola, Florida, to, uh, on, which is east of the Mississippi Delta, to the west side of the Mississippi Delta as far as Vermilion Bay. And this is a straight line distance of about 325 miles. But if you follow all the curves and all the indentations, and not just the outer barrier island shorelines, but also the um, lagoon and bay side shorelines. Really, the, the amount of uh, vulnerable shorelines is in the thousands of miles in this area. And not only is the tremendous uh, length of the vulnerable shoreline a, a major challenge, um, but it's the type of shorelines the shoreline types that make responding to this spill very difficult. Responders use maps that classify shoreline types according to their sensitivity, sensitivity to stranded oil and the difficulty in cleaning up the oil once it impacts that shoreline. And the shorelines are ranked from one to 10, um, with 10 being the most sensitive. And a rank of one includes man-made, in, in this area anyway, includes man-made structures such as vertical, solid um, bulkheads or seawalls where the oil will just bounce off and, and if they're in an exposed location, they won't necessarily stick, that the oil will not necessarily stick. And, and if the oil does impact these man-made solid structures, uh, it's easy to wash it off and then collect the oil uh, in, the, in the water. And uh, sandy, gravelly beaches, which is what we have along the exposed Gulf shorelines predominantly, uh, rank from about three to six, depending on their grain size, uh, which controls how deeply the oil may penetrate into the, into the sediment. Uh, coarser sediments are more porous, more permeable, and, and hence have a higher ranking uh, of six. Uh, salt marshes rank as 10. Uh, very difficult to clean the oil once it hits, hits the salt marsh uh, without doing more damage than good. And uh, also because of the uh, tremendous uh, bulk productivity and the importance of the marsh areas, uh, give them a rank of 10. And unfortunately, well over half of the current vulnerable shorelines rank is 10, which are marshes. And furthermore, much of the marsh shoreline along the Mississippi Delta and in the Florida Big Bend area, which we haven't heard too much about because it's been east of the impact so far, but that could change. They're not well protected by Sandy Barrier Islands at all. And so this is a reason after apparently much political debate and, and debate in the uh, public uh, scene, but apparently little technical or scientific debate that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers issued an emergency permit to Louisiana to construct some protective berms, essentially artificial barrier islands to try and keep the oil from getting back into these uh, very sensitive areas in the first place. About 35 miles of the requested 128 miles have been authorized now and are currently being constructed. Um, clean up. So how do, we, uh, how do we clean up a shoreline? How do we decide on, on what to do? 
And currently, shoreline cleanup and assessment teams, or SCAT teams, are mapping the shorelines for oil. And you can see the SCAT data on this website now, geoplatform.gov. And these teams typically include state and federal representatives, a BP representative or a responsible party representative, a mapping expert, a permit, um, perhaps a landowner representative, and a coastal geologist. And they will send their observations to a technical advisory group who will devise countermeasures or cleanup strategies and recommend this to the federal on-scene coordinator who is a, a Coast Guard re -admiral, rear admiral. And these countermeasures may include simply picking the oil up, as we've seen uh, on the news, on a sandy beach where the oil hasn't penetrated much, or removing oil sediment, a tilling of the sediment to mechanically agitate it and expose it. We might add nutrients to enhance biodegradation, could burn it in, even in the marsh, or washing it off the shoreline into the water and skimming it, to, to name a few uh, of these countermeasures or cleanup techniques. In devising the countermeasure, the technical advisory, advisory group will always ask the question, will use of the countermeasure do more harm than good? And science or technical experience will not always be able to answer that question unambiguously. And furthermore, there may be a very uh, intense public pressure to do something rather than just nothing, which actually may be the better avenue in, in, in these marsh settings in particular. And that pressure may overwhelm the decision-making process, so that public pressure. And I'm sure we're going to hear about these situations uh, over the next week and over the next year or two. And uh, I'll end there. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. Well, yeah, during our last uh, uh, panel meeting, one of our uh, audience came up and asked a question. She had just been on, on, on the beach and had uh, come across tar on the beach. was very <coughs> concerned that that tar was, uh, was coming from, from the spill. And, uh, and at the time, we didn't have a response uh, because we didn't know much about it. We have since found out, no, it did not come from, from uh, the uh, BP spill. There are other incidents that do happen, and this was, was one of those. Where we're very lucky here in South Texas, I'm sure it's true on the upper coast, but I know for sure here, we have a great working relationship between the TCEQ, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, the GLO, General Land Office, and TPWD, Texas Parks and Wildlife, and they work very closely with the Coast Guard, and they had been right on top of that, that particular spill, had people out cleaning it up right away. So they're looking very, very carefully uh, now, and so if you do uh, see any uh, uh, incidents of oil spill or something like that, please do report those, you can get those hotline numbers and report them because they're, they're going to be right on top of it. So it's, it's, a, it's a great service that we have here in South Texas and we're fortunate to, to have. Our next expert on the panel been with us before, Dr. David Yosquitz. Uh, David is a, an economist. He specializes in identification and evaluation of ecosystem services in coastal zones. He leads the <coughs> Gulf of Mexico Ecosystem Service Collaboratory. Basically, the group is trying to pour, put an appropriate monetary value on the services that healthy ecosystems provide, like storm protection, water filtration, fishery production, things like that. It's a really important exercise as we move into restoration and, and recovery from this bill, because uh, one, those responsible parties are responsible for funding that, that work and responsible for the damages, but you have to quantify those damages, how much, they, how much the, those damages in, in, in dollars. And so this work is really important for a number of reasons. And so I asked Dr. Yosipas to come back and kind of give us an update on, on what's happening in that regard. Thank you, Larry. Um, as, as you mentioned, Larry mentioned, I was on the first panel at the beginning of the month. And, and at that time, there was a lot of questions about, well, what would be the total economic impact of this spill or blowout? And I can say over a month's time that number has not surfaced. We, we do not know that value as of yet. What we do know, though, is, is what BP has spent on trying to you know, clean this up and, and work with it. And we know what the government has billed them. You know, BP has spent so far about $2.3 uh, million to try to get a handle on this, and the government has billed BP for about $122 million worth of work that they themselves have put in. But there's still a lot of impact taking place in terms of um, tourism and fisheries, individuals that are out of work. And to start off, I'd like to put these values into context when we look at the Gulf of Mexico. Um, some of the work that we did a few years ago looked at the productive value of the Gulf of Mexico, basically between the United States and Mexico as a total. And what I mean by the productive value, that is 
kind of the extractive value that we get from the Gulf. And looking at four sectors, fisheries, oil and gas, tourism, and shipping, that productive value per year is about $234 billion. Now to put that into context, if that productive value was a you know, country of its own, it would rank 29th out of 230 countries around the world. That's greater than the GDP of Chile, Finland, Venezuela. And that's only in those four particular sectors. Uh, if you look at the employment level of those sectors around the Gulf, uh, oil and gas offshore employs about 150,000 people. Fisheries employs about 20,000 people. Tourism employs about 400,000 people in those various sectors. Something that's come out of, of recent is, you know, with the moratorium that has been placed and now, I guess, temporarily lifted off uh, with offshore drilling, 33 particular projects that are ongoing at this point, how will that impact uh, or potentially impact uh, the various economies? And there is about, you know, depending upon the various numbers that you see, there's about 7,500 people that are directly employed on those offshore rigs that were, you know, uh, held up because of the moratorium. And each one of those jobs is about sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year. So you take seventy five hundred people and sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year and you put them out of work, that's about a half a billion dollars that are taken out in terms of wages. So that's definitely an impact to the coastal communities of the Gulf states, but as well as to the rest of the US. Um, the Gulf states, the five Gulf states, the, what we account for in terms of total um, contribution to our gross uh, domestic product would be about 10%. So five states out of the 50 states in the U.S. account for 10% of the economic output of this country. That's pretty significant. But even with all these numbers, even with you know talking about the potential employment impacts and potential income in impacts, what does it really matter? I'm going to get a little bit philosophical here. I guess I've had a month to be able to do that to think about in my first discussion. What does it really matter if we don't look at development in a more balanced perspective? I mean, I, I hear a lot on one side and I hear a lot on the other side, but I don't hear enough about talking about development in a balanced perspective. All of us got to here today by some form of transportation. Now, I think very few of us have pure electric vehicles that are, you know, charged up by solar panels or wind power. So we're using oil and gas products and we will continue for some time being. The question is, how can we continue to develop our offshore oil and gas industry, but in a manner that is responsive to the environmental needs? Now, I didn't say environment. I said environmental needs, okay? because we need our natural resources. And Larry mentioned some of the work that we do is dealing with ecosystem services. Well, the environment provides many services to us as humans that impact our well-being that a lot of times we don't take into account. He mentioned storm protection, a big service to coastal Louisiana that is actually they've been losing quite a bit of over the several decades because of subsidence of wetland loss. These barrier islands that we're blessed with here in Texas provide potentially great storm protection. And that's a service that we don't have to pay for, that we don't have to engineer. So the question is, how do we develop offshore, near shore, along the shore, in a way that is balanced, that we can enjoy these natural resources and we can continue to get those services that we rely on? Thank you, thank you, Dara. Uh, I've had, of course, had the opportunity uh, over the several weeks to uh, go and visit oil spill itself. I've been in the Mississippi, Alabama, and in the Louisiana side of it. And, uh, and uh, before I came to Heart Research Institute, I uh, ran coastal fisheries uh, for Texas Parks and Wildlife. So I've been much involved with the commercial fishing uh, industry and the, and the people there, and seen them uh, go through uh, hurricanes and uh, competition from uh, from foreign uh, aquaculture and shrimp and, and, and hurricanes of, of, of all of them. And, this type of thing, but you just, two, two, two observations that I saw. One is, until this spill occurred, it, it was, it's very difficult to uh, express how tied our, our economy is in this part of the coast, particularly Louisiana and Mississippi, how tied it is to a healthy ecosystem. 
we talk about it, but the fact is, they have, we're seeing it right now. When it's closed down, you can see the economic impact. So that's just kind of the the professorial type look at it. But what gets me, and it just it, uh, it it's really hard to talk about, is when you talk to those people there uh, that are out of work, uh, that their, their livelihoods are ended, and they they've only known this. So think about your own job. Uh, that what you know, all of a sudden someone came and says, by the way, you can't go to work tomorrow. And and you may be able to go to work next you know next year or six months or eight months, but you just can't go tomorrow. And that's really what's happening. So that I'm a biologist and of course I'm very much concerned about the environment, but the human the human impact and tragedy of what's happening to a whole group of people is 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 really uh, you know, I just can't even express express you can't imagine it really until you, you talk to them and see it. Um, well we we talked about habitat, we talked about the economics. And so our last uh, our panel uh, member today, uh, Dr. Greg Stuns, is going to talk with us uh, about uh, the impact of fisheries and animal and, and that, that side. Dr. Stuns is a marine ecologist. He has expertise in the fisheries ecology and particularly how marine habitats support sustainable populations of, of in fisheries. His research program focuses on uh, marine ecological issues related to ocean health. Uh, Dr. Stuns conducts uh, extensive field research on marine animals, from all marine animals, from sharks to shrimp and just about everything in between. So I couldn't think of anyone better to, to put in perspective the impact of this oil spill in, in that area. So uh, Dr. Stuns, please. All right, well, well, thanks, Larry. And I guess a lot of you obviously have been here for our panel discussions and heard a variety of experts. And so I thought I'd talk just something about a little bit different in terms of direct impact on fisheries and the, the habitats that are supporting those fisheries and unlike oil, fisheries are a renewable resource. If we manage the resource properly, it will, it will always be there. But of course, that's not always the case. And then sort of to, to end, just to answer a, a question that I'm getting quite a bit is just, is our seafood safe to eat? You know, should we eat fish this evening? So uh, anyway, to give you a little uh, background perspective, so as, as Dr. Jabot pointed out, we're talking about the Gulf, so we've got 47,000 miles of coastline and, and, and barrier island shores, um, and about 580,000 square miles of water that's supporting tremendously productive fisheries. Uh, commercial fishermen, for example, um, are harvesting 1.3 billion pounds of fish, and including shellfish. Uh, the major players in that in the Gulf of Mexico are red snapper and shrimp, brown shrimp uh, in particular. But we all know about, like to eat oysters and blue crabs and a whole variety of other fish like groupers and, and things. Uh, there's a whole other side to that, and that's the sport fishing industry that uh, Dr. Yasquiz can tell you about the tremendously important economic impact that those guys generate and the, the money that, they, that flows into the Gulf from that activity. But there's about 3.2 million anglers went into the Gulf of Mexico um, in 2008 are our last numbers, and they spent 24 million fishing trips fishing there. So uh, clearly important in impact. Um, if you look at the shrimp production in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, 80, um, shrimp production in the U.S., 80% of that is coming from the Gulf of Mexico, 67% uh, of all the oyster landings, and 25% of blue crab. And so that's a lot, obviously, and, and interestingly, most of that productivity is directly tied to the estuaries and productivity um, of the bays and marshes, and in fact, sitting right in the bullseye of that is, is Louisiana, that's doing about 71% of that pro productivity. So obviously, we're very concerned, not only what's happening out in the blue water of the Gulf, but how these are gonna impact these um, resources right next to shore. Uh, sadly, um, you know, you've heard many times you attended this, 25 square miles per year of wetlands, these, these habitats that are supporting this renewable, renewable resources are lost every year. I mean, interestingly, by the time we finish this panel discussion, two more football fields will be gone of, of wetlands uh, in Louisiana. And that's before oil impacts and hurricanes and things like that. That's just from, from other activities going on. So uh, our primary concerns that we have is relate to fisheries and their productivity. I mean, obviously, we're, we're watching storms with something brewing in the Caribbean as we speak. You know, that could drastically change our action plans as we're going about that. And so we share a lot of those concerns with a variety of scientists. But from, a, from a, my standpoint and my expertise, these toxins getting into the food webs um, from the oil themselves or activities associated with the dispersants are, are something interesting that I'll be happy to answer some questions. But what I'm, what I'm really concerned about is just the sheer enormous productivity that comes from the Gulf and, and protecting that. And uh, it really gets to that if you don't have these uh, habitats, you don't have young fish and you don't have the babies to support the adults. And so we'll be looking at impacts of these many years down the line. Many fisheries like these majestic bluefin tuna 
take 10 years to mature and, and we won't see the impacts of the larvae that might be dying today and, and until several years down the line. So um, the last thing I guess not to end on, you know, total doom has been some recent good news lately. Uh, it was a very precautionary approach. Uh, NOAA had closed substantial regions of the Gulf to um, commercial and recreational fishing, even catch and release. Um, just as in the last 24 hours, they opened up about 8,000 square miles to um, fishing activities. So that represents approximately about 32% of the Gulf is now closed. And so the, the question obviously is, well, is seafood safe to eat? And the good news to that is, is yes. Um, most, much of the Gulf is open to perfectly safe seafood, or at least as safe as it was before the, the oil spill occurred. <laughs> and um, uh, the uh, NOAA and working with the Department of Health and other state and federal agencies are really on top of the issue in terms of um, extracting you know, food from the ocean. There's groups of people sampling inside and outside of the spill zones, it's inshore and offshore. Um, ensuring that the fish are safe, they're visiting markets randomly to ensure those fish are, are safe to eat from a variety of techniques from chemical type tests to some of the most simplest, one of the best ways we have to determine the health of a or safe a fish's smell. You know, plenty of experts that know that, that smell the fish for oily compounds and others to ensure that it's safe. But, but as, as it sits today, eating seafood is safe if it's coming from in certain zones in the Gulf. So. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. I appreciate it. Well, now it's time to, to hear from uh, you all. And if you have questions, we'd love to have you ask them. And uh, those of you who are listening to or watching us, uh, you can get your questions in. Just email us at questions, question with an S, questions at kebt.org. And we do have a question uh, back to, uh, from our listening audience. So please go ahead. Dr. McKinney, Tom in Porter Ramses asks, what are likely to be the short and long-term effects of the oil spill on dissolved O2 levels and general hypoxia throughout the water column? I think it's a really good question. Uh, I know Tom has said that earlier to me as well and had a lot more detail in which, which I appreciate. He's clearly had the scientific background uh, and we kind of condensed that, that question. But uh, does anyone on our panel want to, want to take a shot at, at uh, how will you know, they, we talked about these oil spills. The oil spill is uh, because of dispersants and uh, activity in the plumes. There is some low oxygen areas in some areas. Some of these clouds have very high methane concentrations in them. Uh, and then you don't have the normal, unfortunately, the normal hypoxic zone that does farm up off the Mississippi on a pretty annual basis. That hypoxic zone can reach as much as 7,000 square miles about the area the size of, of Delaware on, on a regular basis. So the question is, are those two going to combine to be worse or what? And Dr. Stunned, I think. I probably could feel that. Um, hypoxia or, or low dissolved oxygen levels in the water that, that typically impair uh, marine life are nothing new. In fact, it's a big problem we were dealing with. Probably the leading problem in the Gulf before this latest incident. In fact, it's happening right across the street in the bay right here, probably as we speak, if not in the next few months. Uh, typically, uh, larger fish can avoid that, but there's many marine life that, that can't and things that live in the bottom that are particularly susceptible to these low oxygen levels. Uh, what we are concerned with um, as it relates to the oil accident is that the, the hypoxia is going to be there whether there's oil or not. Oil and dispersants and other things in the water column can create a chain of events where certain marine life die and decompose and during that process they can exacerbate the oxygen levels in the water creating even worse conditions. And uh, if you've been to these panels you've, you've heard about cumulative effects. Um, Fish and marine life tend to do good. They can, they're very resilient and they can handle low DO or they can handle a certain level of toxins, but when you combine the two, it becomes very toxic even at, at levels you may not suspect. So while I don't have an answer and I don't know of really any scientist that would have the specifics on exactly what's gonna happen, we're very, very concerned about the increasing size of this hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico and, and how the oil could uh, increase that potential problem. Yeah, I do know in, in talking with other scientists that are out actually on ships right now uh, sampling these areas, this, this is a big issue, a big question for them. Uh, and they are concerned that, that uh, because what's happening is you have these large uh, clouds of uh, oil, perhaps subsurface, so some of it's very deep, some of it's not so deep. Uh, and there's a lot of mic uh, microbial activity going on in these clouds that these microbes are eating these oil. Well, when they eat oil, they consume oxygen. Also, uh, in these clouds is, uh, is a tremendous concentrations of methane, 10,000 times, at least in one cloud, some 10,000 times normal. And that has a, 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 an effect too. So they're looking very closely. I think it's a good question that, as Dr. Stun said, we don't know the answer to it, but it's, it's not gonna be good. It's not gonna be positive, we, we know that. We just hope that it's not uh, 
uh, compounding uh, an already difficult situation. Uh, another question, I think, uh, from our listening audience. Al says, considering there is still oil from the Exxon Valdez a decade later, just a few feet beneath the surface of the shoreline, what implications could this have for the cleanup along the Gulf of Mexico? Um, what about that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, try to answer that. Um, actually, it's been two decades or more since the Exxon Valdez spill, and there is still oil on the shorelines, or I should say within the shoreline sediments and in Prince William Sound. Um, it's a very different setting. There uh, boulder and cobble beaches and, and bedrock fractures are the problem areas that, that retain uh, oil in Prince William Sound and also in very uh, low energy settings in, in quiet water coves and, and places like that in Prince William Sound. Here it's a very different situation. Um, we expect the rate of biodegradation to be much higher than in Prince William Sound because of the uh, temperatures involved. And uh, hopefully um, much of the oil will be picked up, it, it will, uh, at least on the sandy beaches and, and, and taken away. The, the marshes uh, could, could be a lingering problem for years. And if marsh areas are killed off and sediments are released, released uh, that could have a broader impact um, that are related to the spill, uh, causing more more marsh areas to deteriorate and to, and to erode. And so, uh, although we might not have the oil still residing in the environment, we will still be uh, living with the impacts of this spill for years to come. Good response, thank you very much. Um, another, um, another question uh, that's come up, and basically it's a very sharp one, and, but it's very appropriate, so I'll pull this one out. It says basically, Oh, how would a hurricane change this? How would it affect the oil spill? I think it's particularly appropriate, as many of you may know, there is a, there is a depression in the Caribbean now. Uh, and some uh, forecasters are predicting uh, that it will uh, you'll come, come this direction and turn perhaps to category one coming in ashore northern Mexico or even even southern US. That, that's a possibility. So I'm unfortunate for us here in Corpus. Uh, heads up, guys. <laughs> we, we're, we're in it early this year. We got away with it last year. We may not this year, so we may have to deal with this. We don't, of course, it's early to tell, and that's just one model. But nonetheless, uh, that has been, a, has been a concern. What would be the impact of a hurricane on, on this situation? So, if anyone on our panel want to want to take a shot at, at that particular? What would be that impact? Well, um, I'll I'll uh, speak to that again, uh, at least initially here. Um, it's going to be very difficult to predict what the Im impact was will be, and. And likely it'll be good and bad. Uh, we count on high energy waves to, to hit the beaches and, and to naturally disperse the oil. That would be a good thing. On the other hand, if we have a, uh, well, along with the surge, um, we have elevated water levels that tend to transport oil further into the marsh complexes and they get past the barrier islands and through the passes. Uh, and then oil these more sensitive environments in the bays, then that's a very likely scenario and that would not be a good thing. Uh, also, uh, it will depend on the precise track of the uh, hurricane, uh, but I, I think that any track uh, into the Northern Gulf region will set up, generally speaking, westward uh, currents that could disperse oil and smear it along the, the shoreline toward the west. Um, the amount of rainfall in, in the hurricane could have uh, a major uh, impact. That could be good, actually. Uh, if we get a, a lot of rainfall inland and we get large uh, seaward flow, that might tend to flush the uh, oil out of some of these coastal uh, habitats. That, that would be a good thing. But, so it's, the bottom line is it's very difficult to predict the, the impact that a hurricane will have. For one reason, um, we haven't experienced this before, and each hurricane is, is different. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jacob. You know, one of the things that, that, I've, that I've been doing through this film, I can't help myself, I shouldn't do this, but, but it's kind of like this doomsday watch. I keep sitting down every night to calculate how much oil is, is coming out of the, out of the gusher uh, now, and calculate, and of course they're trying the best they can to, to capture them, and they are doing so, but, but my, by my calculations, and we're at day 66, uh, something like 123 million gallons have, have uh, you know, escaped so far. Now, a lot of that hopefully has been captured and burned, and that's, that's, that's a good thing. But 
but my, and my countdown, of course, is the, the worst accidental um, uh, oil spill uh, in history was Hickstock, uh, and, and that was 140 million gallons. And so we're creeping slowly toward that number, so it's not a record we would like to, to have, but we are moving that direction. Uh, and so the, we're looking more and more, and, and I'll talk about this in a second, toward what was the impact of Hickstock? That was 30 years ago, and it was the biggest uh, accidental oil spill in history. Did, what do we see about it today? And I think some questions were raised, uh, comments you made about that. We want to talk about it in a second, but I think we've got another question. I want to get to those questions as soon as we can. Uh, Dr. McKinney, this one is a, a bit involved. I've tried to distill some of it down. There seems to be, uh, this is from ISIS, there seems to be a consensus that the oil spill will most likely not impact the Texas coast. However, in these statements, I feel that only the impacts of visible oil are being addressed. There are many species in the Gulf that are mobile enough to leave the areas that have been impacted by the spill. This emigration and deviation from the normal habitat or normal range is bound to have effects in other areas of the Gulf. Uh, she gives some examples of live and dead rays being found in large numbers in Galveston, as well as uh, large numbers of live and dead, uh, perhaps ghost crabs in the same area. Couldn't this be an indirect result of the oil in the Gulf as the mobile species in the Gulf are able to leave the impacted area and be and are being forced to leave, or perhaps they are migrating to different <coughs> areas that don't normally populate for foraging purposes, as their typical food supply in their habitat is now threatened and declining. Has anyone addressed the impact that this shift in habitat use by these species could have on other fishery species? I think that's an ex excellent question, and, and that is something that's actually, we're beginning to hear little rumors here and there about that. I'm going to ask Dr. Stunz to answer and uh, respond to this in a second, but I will kind of tell you what, I, what I'm hearing. And, and we, we've heard those reports. I've, had, I've been asked about them myself, about uh, the uh, uh, numbers of species you might typically see further out offshore, moving closer to inshore. Tiger shark is one uh, uh, issue in, in Florida. Other species being, are they being displaced? They see some species that are normally further offshore, they're seeing them closer into shore. Are they being herded uh, by, by these harsh conditions? And, and that's a possibility. There is a, a, a report um, today about a, a massive die-off of sea cucumbers. Sea cucumbers are basically look like long pickles. Uh, uh, and there are and they're different types of them. We, we're trying to find out information about them now. There's just reports there. Why is it significant and who cares? Well, it, they could be. Uh, some of these uh, organisms live in very deep water. Uh, and maybe these were in some of the, on the bottom of these oil plumes, perhaps, or something like that. So we're seeing these things show up, uh, and it's, of course, of great concern to us. And you, we would expect this to happen because of the, the spill has gone on now, and we have these uh, long-term impacts, and, and things are shifting a bit, because this is an ecosystem-level um, uh, disaster, frankly. Dr. Stein. Well, I, I can comment a little bit. Obviously, that was a long question, so I don't know if I can hit everything. But uh, just some general facts, you know, the. Uh, Animals, marine animals are stranded every day. I mean, obviously we have the, the stranding networks. There, recently there's been about 500 sea turtles stranded. Of those 592 were directly you know, impacted. There was visible oil impact on those turtles. Uh, there uh, was a report of you know, a large sperm whale, and I don't know the latest if that had actual oil impacts. So the, the question is, clearly some animals are being affected and certain animals can detect the oil, or at least they can detect chemicals in the oil and avoid that, particularly the larger pelagic animals, the highly migratory species. And uh, there's sort of another issue is that right now everybody's out there looking for strandings. There's a lot more people looking, so is, is this normal stranding rate or is this just because uh, there's more people looking at? So uh, that's got a, a lot of people concerned, but there's many, many groups right on top of this to uh, assess the situation and, and many of the turtles have been rehabilitated, four actually have died with direct impacts of spills, for example. Um, particularly with some of the work we have going on here at the Heart Research Institute, we have many animals tagged with satellite and acoustic tags. And uh, fortunately, I guess if you want to use that word, we'll be able to detect movements of some of our large, uh, I'm sorry, pelagic sharks that will potentially be moving in and near this oil spill and, and watch what they do from satellites, essentially. But to really provide an answer to your question, like many that are that are proposed, and, and Jim did a good job of pointing out, we're we're brand new to this spill of this magnitude, and what is really going to happen is we don't have a lot of scientific answers, but we will begin to developing those and answering those questions as as we speak and in years to come. Dr. Yasmin, something has a comment? 
Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on what Greg was talking about. And, and we were talking about the migration of the fisheries. I think one thing that we want to look at is, is migration of humans as a result of this uh, oil spill or blowout. And Greg and I had a, I had a chance to help Greg's lab sample a couple of days ago. And we were talking a little bit about this issue. And that is, you know, the blue crab fishery and the oyster fishery and the shrimp fishery are shut down long enough what happens with those fishermen? I mean, they're not going to just give up their jobs easily. They're going to move and find new grounds to fish. So what could that potentially mean for Texas? So it's more of a statement and a question. And, and maybe Larry or, or uh, Greg could answer that. No, I think, I think you're exactly on that. In fact, there was a question here about, well, uh, the question I'll paraphrase it was, so we, have, we know about the impact of, of this uh, oil spill on Louisiana fishermen and processing into water. Are, are, how broad are those impacts? How far out are they going? How far out are those impacts extending? Uh, and uh, and I think that's you hit on one of them because uh, you know we have in Galveston they take oysters for example, Louisiana huge oyster producer. It's all closed now. They can't get them not hardly at all. The next biggest producer is Galveston Bay. Well, the hurricane uh, Ike uh, hit Galveston Bay and smothered many many of the reefs. So that's cut down. Where are there where now where are the oysters? You can look out the window of our institute and look down that way. It's in, it's in Aranda's Bay and places like that. And so all those oystermen are going to go for oysters someplace because the price is going to be really high. It's going to be good. Now the problem is, do you have a hundred oyster boats going down the oyster region doing all the damage here, concentrating in one area? That's a real possibility, and that that's one of those displacement I think. That's, that's really really critical. I think that, that, was a, that was a good point. And so. it's displacing the recreational fishermen as well. Charter captains are starting to show up in Port Aransas as we speak to move their business from areas that they can't fish to areas that they can. And so it might be a good time to go charter a boat to go fishing, but it's not really good for those poor guys that are having to try to make a living as, as we've talked about. Uh, what, one thing I can give you a report on uh, uh, is uh, Dr. Sylvia Earl was on our panel last week. Dr. Earl is the chair of our advisory committee. She called me uh, this morning. Uh, she had the opportunity to go out and spill to, to look at some of the issues. She was at a place called Ewing Bank. It's uh, just off the Louisiana, off the uh, southeast part of the uh, bird foot. Uh, and uh, that's what they were doing to the filming, and they had a, a plane, she was in the diving, and they had a plane flying over, and in one frame of the uh, photograph from the airplane, they counted 91 whale sharks. Whale sharks are the largest marine fish. They're filter feeders, plankton feeders. Uh, of these 91, and they, they assumed there could be as many as 200 in this particular area, they were from 15 feet long to 35 feet long. This is with, within 50 miles, something like that, of the oil spill. Uh, these types of animals, they're there feeding because this is a very rich area, but they clearly have, uh, in reality, not even, uh, uh, they have a heavy black cloud hanging over their heads right now. And so what happens if they were to get into that, what, a, what an impact that would be because of the way they feel. So, so there's, there's big issues at stake out in the open ocean. We do have a question from the audience, so please go ahead. Um, hi, I think this question is going to go for Dr. Jaskowitz. Um, would it be prudent to take into account um, when you're making um, a tally of all the indirect uh, costs of this bill, all the conservation research and man hours uh, that have been put into the uh, preservation of species or even mar restora marsh restoration in the Gulf, um, I, I have a feeling that all that effort that was put into preserving and enhancing uh, all these resources, it, now it's gone. So would that be a good thing to put in the tab? I mean, uh, <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you think? <laughs> I, think she's, I think she's giving you the answer. I always like to turn the questions back on the uh, question. Um, well, I'm just thinking like in the, whenever, whenever there's a disaster, there's a lot of indirect costs that are not taken into account, maybe this one should be in there somewhere too. Well, that, that's a very good question. Let, let me um, let me tell you a little bit about the, the process that, I, as I see it, possibly folding out is um, NOAA has this this process that they go through the natural resource damage assessment. Um, for the first time in that process, ecosystem services will be accounted for, so that they will be valued in as part of damage value the damage uh, to the environment and the value of those services now 
whether the, the, the value of people's effort in conserving marshland will be accounted for, I'm not sure about that. I think that might be a reach. <coughs> but the fact that they are going to account for services is a tremendous step. Let me give you an example. Larry and I did a quick um, kind of white note uh, about a month and a half ago. Uh, we calculated potentially off of a number that we got from NOAA, if there was 500,000 acres of marsh impacted by this blowout, what would be the impact to tourism, recreational fishing, commercial fishing, and the ecosystem services of storm protection and waste treatment? Well, that total of that 500,000 acres came up to be about $1.6 billion a year. 1.2 billion of that was the ecosystem services and only 400 million of it or so was the normal market services. So that just gives you an indication of how important these services are. And so the fact that that's gonna be included in this damage assessment process is a big step forward. Now what you're asking for I think might be a reach though, but, but it's nonetheless valuable, don't get me wrong. I think it is valuable, but it, this time around it may be tough. And the economic implications of this uh, of this bill are, are huge. Uh, as, as I was saying, while I was in this bill area last a couple of weeks, every other commercial on TV is for attorneys talking to the people like how they're going to help them get their damages recovered. So it, as they said, it's been a pretty full uh, employment act for attorneys. But I have, in full disclosure, I have to say that it's doing a pretty good act for marine biologists uh, as well as a job because there's a lot to be learned and done. And that's a sad comment, actually because how little we do know and what we have not known in this, what we have not invested in is understanding our ecosystem and how it functions as best as we should. And now we're having a really tough lesson trying to answer these questions without without all the information we need. So so we have, it just points out how much we need to know to, to exist. I think we have a question uh, from, uh, go ahead. No, so we have a, uh, a question, okay, uh, audience, start to go ahead uh, and Hi, um, anyone that's been to the Texas beaches here, our local beaches, is aware of how dense the sargasm is <clears throat> on the beaches. And of course, that's not unique to our part of the coast. And I was wondering if uh, one of the panelists might want to remark on the importance of that sargasm to fisheries and how it might be affected by being oiled. That sounds like a Dr. Stubbs question. Anybody could mind? <laughs> so, well, the sargasm or seaweed that Dr. Shirley is, is talking about uh, is very, very important to marine species. And we've been talking a lot about marshes and seagrasses and these estuarine habitats, but out in the open ocean, um, it's too deep uh, for young fish. And so they rely on habitats at the water surface. And there's really just about one you either school or use the seaweed. Well, obviously the seaweed uh, is gonna get mixed with this oil and many of the important species that use that, they're what we call pelagic species, things like uh, tunas, and billfishes and those type of fish uh, could be greatly impacted. Uh, I guess just a comment, I get a lot of questions concerning bluefin tuna, sort of you know, one of the shining stars of the Gulf of Mexico. Most people don't know it, but uh, the Gulf of Mexico is one of the primary spawning spots for these majestic fisheries. Uh, you know, some people are surprised when I, and I'm, where I'm going with this, uh, is that they probably use sargasm as their nursery habitat. Uh, you're talking about fish that routinely sell for $70,000 per individual fish. People raise their eyebrows, that's right, 70,000. Recent record, just recently, 173 for a 400 pound bluefin tuna. So it doesn't take much to realize why these fish are overfished and at 20% of their historical abundance, it turned out the horizon was sitting right pretty much in the bullseye of their spawning grounds and they're spawning pretty much at the peak of when the spill occurred. What will happen to that, you know, we don't, we don't know. I mean, we, no one's looked at the toxicity of dispersants or oil and larval bluefin tuna, but I can't imagine a larval tuna is happy swimming around in oil. So, so unfortunately, we may not see the impacts of those for days to come, but not only is it gonna be toxic to the, the fish directly themselves, the habitats that are supporting these fish, just as important in marsh are you know, these seaweeds that we see washing up on our beaches out there. Thank you, Dr. Sun. One, one thing that uh, proliferates with this type of situation and as it's been going on is that, and, and that with the internet, is the internet rumor mill gins fast and furious. And sure, I'm sure everyone's seeing all kinds of things. I have one that, I, that I've seen lately, and I actually had a reporter call me and ask me about it, and, and I 
And I could answer it, I think. I'm going to find out if I answered it correctly because it's a geology type question, so I'm going to get a geology to answer it. The question was, what would happen? What, aren't we concerned that if the blowout preventer, if that all falls off, which it looks like it's going to do, this is what said in the rumor, when that falls off, uh, and nothing is preventing uh, the, the oil from coming under the surface. We'll have a continuous gusher of, of oil at a huge rate until it empties out and creates a giant cavity uh, under under the uh, billions of, of gallons of oil. It creates a giant cavity that all collapses in. We have an economic disaster that floods Florida. But this is you get the drift. That's how you see them. Uh, along with your messages from Nigeria asking you about your bank account, you probably got that. But I, I think. I'd like to, Dr. Jabot to perhaps respond to that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Respond to yeah, I'll, um, I'll try. Uh, <laughs> actually, I was trying to find out uh, before this panel just what the uh, reservoir estimates are for uh, what the, they tapped into here. Um, I wasn't really able to do that. I, either they don't know or, or that kind of information is held very closely by, by the oil companies. Also, the character and the distribution of these reservoirs. The oil companies pay a lot of money uh, to get those data and, and so they don't give it out to anyone, uh, for free anyway. Um, but I, 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 the, the idea that it would turn, that it's a big cavity down there full of oil is, is incorrect. Uh, it's probably That's good. Uh, that was the one I wanted oh, to okay. <laughs> get that one pretty quick. All right. Well, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, <laughs> Answer that question. Uh, how long it would flow uh, if if uh, the relief wells uh, weren't drilled or successful? I don't have a good answer for that, too. But uh, it, it looks like it would flow for quite a while, and 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 there's probably a, there's on the order of tens of millions of barrels uh, in this reservoir. That's that's very conservative, I'm sure. Why don't you explain that for a second? I think just to clarify on this giant cavity, why that's not not a possible. That would be a good thing to do. I think. Well, the oil is, is is resides in porous spaces, uh, probably in sandstone in this case, and and it's uh, as as it comes out of out, out of the rock, it's flowing through this. Per it's a permeable rock. It's more like a sponge. A very tight sponge, you know, by by you know intuitive standards anyway. But it's it's not a big cavity. There's just small um, uh, pathways to, to for the oil to have migrated into that area and now for it to come out through the, through the well. Well, th thank you, Dr. Joe. Uh, we have about uh, 10, 10 minutes. Uh, if you have some questions, it's time to get them in here. So uh, email us at questions. Q U E S T I O N S questions with an S at K E D T dot org. And we do have a question, so please, Shane. I have a two part question from Pat and Mary Jane. Does the U.S. experience in responding to and cleaning up the Ishtok oil spill in 1979 give you or anyone on the panel an idea about how long the effects of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill may affect Gulf of Mexico biological and coastal resources? And the second part is something you were discussing in your conference this week, Dr. McKinney. Is it possible that sensitive benthic habitats such as the flower gardens may be affected by subsurface oil plumes? Uh, well, two, two, uh, two good questions, uh, and I'll, I'll just talk about the Ixtoc one first. Uh, that, there, there, is valuable, there are valuable lessons to be learned from Ixtoc, and in fact, I want, I'll let you know that uh, our own the Dr. West Tunnel who was the NOAA coordinator for the stock response here in South Texas when that occurred 30 years ago. He's one of those old geezers like, like me, he's been around a long time, but that's which is really valuable. You tell me <laughs> <laughs> But But we basically, uh, in, uh, in two weeks, uh, Dr. Uh, Tunnel is going to uh, take an expedition back down to Mexico to revisit the sites he sampled down there 30 years ago to look for signs of oil to see if it was there. And there are valuable lessons to be learned from the next time because that was the worst oil spill we ever had, and we did recover from it. And those habitats down there, I would, uh, I would, you wouldn't like me to say this, but they were even more sensitive than what we're dealing with up here in a very dynamic wetland system. There are coral reefs and uh, mangroves and those types of things, but they have come back. Yes, there's some changes in impact. We want to look at that because I think we can learn less because this oil spill will end and we will be going into recovery and we can recover and we will. But there's valuable lessons to be learned from, from Nick Stock. I don't know what our panel does. Yeah, Larry, Larry, I'll add that the uh, Texas beaches Gulf beaches were oiled uh, that summer, uh, all the way from uh, South Padre Island up up to uh, about where we are now, um, and, and a bit farther. And fortunately, none of the oil uh, was able to enter 
the, uh, into the estuaries, into the bays, and into Laguna Madre or Corpus Christi Bay here, which is where you know, those tens are, those marsh shorelines that I talked about earlier. Um, but there was heavy oiling uh, all along the shoreline here out on the barrier islands. But after a tropical storm passed through that fall, uh, repeat surveys that, that went out after that saw a, a remarkable uh, removal, removal of the oil, or most of it. Uh, there were some tar mats left over that were watched for uh, a few years after that. But by and large, the sandy beaches fared, the ones that were oiled, fared very well with respect to um, the, the lingering oil being cleaned up. And Jane, what was the second part of that question? I, I, I forgot, I, I apologize. Oh, we'll use your mind, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't uh, What was the second part of the question? Is it, is it possible that sensitive benthic habitats, such as the flower gardens, may be affected by subsurface oil plumes? Thank you, and that, and uh, of course, let uh, panel answer. That, that is an issue. Dr. Dubow talked about it, and this is the situation of having difficult choices. Yes, uh, trying to protect those weapons, keep the oil out of it, using dispersants and those types of things, but this, oil spill because it's taking place at 5,000 feet of depth uh, at about 2,000 pounds per square inch pressure when it's coming out, 30,000 psi is blowing out of the hose, creating these uh, clouds or plumes uh, of oil that, uh, that are not reaching the surface that are mixed with methane. And some of these uh, clouds have been reported to you know, the size of the city of San Francisco, 600 feet thick, and others around it. And so what are the impacts of those? And that's, that's something that, like, for example, Dr. Montagna and I have been thinking about and looking at. If there were to be an impact to Texas, uh, our, our area, because of these clouds or depths, if, depending on their, if they're toxic themselves to maintain that, or just low, low oxygen, they have no oxygen or low oxygen in them. Because of the currents that, that change around, those clouds could uh, break loose in a gyre from the loop current, for example. Those gyres do, those uh, do, eddies do drift uh, toward the west and on a regular basis hit the continental shelf, at, even in the mid-Texas area, and can break up or move on the shore. So it's very possible, uh, if, that, if those clouds exist, that they, they could drift over a flower garden, very sensitive to low oxygen, those types of things, and could have those impacts. We don't know, that's the unseen part of this. We've talked about wetlands, we talked about uh, tuna and those types of things, but what we don't know is what's going on underneath. The point being that this is, a, <coughs> as we said, this is an ecosystem scale event. It's affecting everything and how it all works together. So it's, it's a, a really a great concern. Uh, Dr. Stein, are any, any of our panels uh, any want to comment on, on the benthic impact? Well, uh, I could just briefly comment. I mean, obviously we we're very concerned with the benthic and the benthos, the bottom of the ocean, and the marine life that lived there is really essential for the ecological functioning of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, fortunately, just to add the latest projections I just saw, is that I, right now at least, and pending no hurricanes and things like that, the flower gardens are on the good side if you want to call it that, of the spill. And um, although an eddy has broken off, it's kind of just sitting there and not really in the loop current. So as it stands today, that's a good, a good sign, but you know, who knows what will happen in the next few days as currents change all the time in the Gulf. And it's certainly something we're going to have to be uh, looking at. Uh, as we go forward, there's some other questions. Uh, here, here's one, uh, I think we've answered this, but it, it was asked again, so let's do, uh, is Texas seafood safe to eat now? Is, is, is oil spill affecting that, our seafood? Yes, safe. Totally safe, safe. That's what I like to hear. Okay, it's safe, so you can eat it. The problem is, can you find them? Uh, <laughs> that, that's the other side. Uh, we, we had uh, uh, talked about the impacts here in Corpus Christi, for example, where we have an oyster restoration program in conjunction with Water Street the restaurants here where we collect our oyster shell and been doing that uh, regularly to rebuild oyster reefs. And typically every three to four days, we get six to 800 pounds of oyster shells. So people in, in Corpus love to eat their oysters on a hand show. It's good. But since this, uh, in the last few weeks, since the uh, spill has affected oyster production, we get about a five gallon bucket full of oyster shell. That's, and they can't find oysters. So uh, we're going to be paying more. We certainly are, are doing that. Well, I want to thank uh, our panel for being here. And I want to mention one more time, this was the fourth and final panel uh, that we had. I'm going to get our, our panel to make a last remark perhaps in a second. But uh, again, thank KDT for helping us and the audience being here. I want to let you know again uh, that um, we have another panel that the local Nueces County Oil Spill Response Summit will be held July 9th um, here on the university uh, from 2.30 to 4.30. And Judge Neal has put this panel together, bring in all the experts uh, from South Texas to, to say, are we ready? to respond to this oil spill if we have to deal with it. But more importantly, 
What if there is another oil spill uh, uh, of another type? Can we respond? Because we now have the most graphic illustration of the economic and ecological impacts of an oil spill that we, we hope we will ever see. Uh, and so we basically want to be, be prepared for that. Again, I thank the panel and the audience for being here, the KDT for allowing us to do this. This couldn't happen in any other format. Uh, we appreciate the listeners out there supporting the station. Uh, thank you again, and uh, I'll be talking to you soon.